The decade of the 1920s was an exciting time in American history. Deemed the Roaring Twenties by historians, it was a period of unparalleled prosperity. It was a time of rapid industrialization and social experimentation. It was an era of artistic renaissance and new roles for women. It was a time of heroes and villains. It was the Jazz Age. As the 1920s began, America was weary from the battlefields of World War I. The American people were tired of their country's interventionism and wanted to avoid future foreign wars that could cause heavy American death tolls. President Woodrow Wilson failed to win enough support for the Treaty of Versailles, and the treaty failed to be ratified. As a result, America dropped out of the League of Nations. In 1920, the Republican presidential candidate Warren G. Harding promised a return to normalcy, meaning America would isolate itself from the rest of the world and focus on the problems at home. A return to normalcy was just what Americans wanted. Harding's campaign was successful, and he was inaugurated President of the United States in 1921. In addition to the changes in governmental attitudes, the American people faced an enormous social change when a new series of laws called Prohibition went into effect. The 18th Amendment passed during the Wilson administration banned the production, distribution, and sale of alcoholic beverages. Prohibition was the end result of years of lobbying by the temperance movement. Members of groups such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League argued that alcohol, while legal, was a detriment to society. They felt that ending the production and sale of such drinks would help the poor by enabling them to save the money they'd normally waste on liquor. Temperance crusaders also felt that prohibition would protect the young from alcoholism and other problems associated with drinking. Businessmen agreed, feeling that worker productivity would increase if production of alcohol ceased. On January 16, 1920, America became a dry nation. Despite the best intentions of the temperance movement, prohibition was a failure. No sooner was the law enacted than thousands of illegal bars began to sprout up, called speakeasies. These underground establishments were available only to patrons who knew the password. Speakeasies often occupied back rooms and basements of legitimate businesses and offered paying customers their choice of illegal drinks. Bootlegging, the illegal manufacture of alcohol, became a source of income for some Americans, and none benefited more than those involved in organized crime. Rival gangs controlled the flow of liquor and fought each other for control of the streets. Civilians were sometimes caught in the crossfire. As crime increased, it became clear that prohibition was not working. No law was more openly violated by the American people. Despite this, prohibition remained the law of the land until it was repealed in 1933. Americans faced other problems as the decade began. After World War I, as war production ceased, the United States slipped into an economic slump. President Harding and his successor, Calvin Coolidge, believed that the future of America lay in big business. The business of America is business, President Coolidge said in a speech. The newly isolationist government supported the growth of big business and prosperity soon followed. Coolidge, known as Silent Cal in the press for his distaste for long speeches, believed that business would take care of itself with little or no governmental interference. To a large part it did. Between 1923 and 1928, national unemployment never rose above 3.7 percent, and industrial workers' wages raised an average of 8 percent. As Americans had more money, they in turn gave back to big business by investing in the stock market. The market soared ahead, reaching new heights and paying increasing dividends. Even those who couldn't afford it invested, buying shares on borrowed money. There seemed to be no end to the market's upward rise. In 
the newfound focus on business was the result of the third industrial revolution. As the nation rapidly industrialized, more and more work became available in factories, and the population in cities swelled. The 1920s marked the first time in history that more Americans lived in cities than in rural areas. Basic utilities such as natural gas, running water, and electricity were becoming increasingly available. With hot and cold running water, people bathed more. Gas stoves decreased the amount of coal dust and kerosene fumes in the home. Electric lights offered a better, safer source of light to citizens who formerly lit their homes with gas lamps and candles. Members of the middle and upper classes could purchase new electric appliances like refrigerators, washing machines, and vacuum cleaners. Another electronic invention was changing American life. On November 2nd, 1920, radio station KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania broadcast the nation's first scheduled public radio program. Though few people actually heard the news program, it was the beginning of a new information era. Just three years later, there were over 500 radio stations broadcasting news, sports, and entertainment programs. By the end of the decade, hundreds of radio stations were linked to form the two major radio networks, the National Broadcasting Corporation and the Columbia Broadcasting System. More than half of American households were tuning into NBC and CBS on their own radio receivers by the end of the decade. Perhaps the most revolutionary change to American life came in the form of the automobile. Cars had been invented long before 1920, but the 20s was the first time cars became affordable to a wider section of the population. This decrease in prices was due to a revolutionary new idea, mass production. Automaker Henry Ford had the idea to create an assembly line of workers, all with a special skill. As a new car model proceeded down the assembly line, workers would apply their unique skill and the car would be completed much faster than was previously possible. This method worked so fast, in fact, that by 1925, Ford boasted that a Model T car was completed every 10 seconds. The result? The Model T's price dropped from $850 to $290 by 1924. By 1929, 23 million cars were driving on America's ever-expanding roadways. In addition to increasing American mobility, the automobile was a key factor in the growth of suburbs. As cities' populations increased, the middle and upper classes moved outward to the surrounding areas. With work in the city just a short drive away, many Americans left the cramped, bustling cities for the cleaner, quieter new communities. The standard of living in America was on the rise. In fact, during the 1920s, Americans enjoyed the highest quality of life in the world. Women in particular were enjoying a much higher standard of living than they'd ever previously known. The 19th Amendment had given women the right to vote, and it was in the 1920 election that women first participated on a national level. Women were now more able to voice their political concerns and social issues were soon given the weight of their support. Lobbying groups like the Women's Trade Union League improved working conditions for women. The National Women's Party tried to gain support for the Equal Rights Amendment. Margaret Sanger fought for women's health education and reproductive rights with her organization, the Women's Birth Control League. Women were also enjoying more social and educational opportunities. More women than ever before were graduating from high school, going to college and getting jobs. Many women became telephone operators, manually connecting phone calls in the rapidly growing industry. Young women benefited the most from these new freedoms. Many young women began questioning the restrictive ideals of women's roles in society. They wanted the same social freedoms that men enjoyed. Called flappers, these young women bobbed their hair, used makeup, and wore more revealing dresses. Flappers went to speakeasies, danced, and kissed men in public. Conservatives were outraged by what they perceived to be the flappers' immoral behavior. In Utah, legislators went so far as to ban skirts that were higher than three inches above the ankle. 
Flappers look to magazines and movies to get ideas about the latest fashions. One movie star in particular, Clara Bow, became the flapper icon of the era, teaching women to be more assertive. Women weren't alone in disregarding the conventions of the past. The 1920s marked the emergence of a distinct youth culture. Fueled by movies, music, and dance, these young people had little intention of living the same lives as their parents. The youth movement was encapsulated by the most popular dance of the era, the Charleston. The Charleston had its roots in African-American culture, but its infectious rhythm soon swept through the white youth of America, who were drawn to its wild, jerky movements and cheerful, upbeat tempos. The dance's fast movements made the loose dresses of the flappers mandatory, and men were often known to wear wide-legged pants called Oxford bags. The Charleston gave young Americans an excuse to kick up their heels and enjoy life. One author in particular summed up the era of the flaming youth. F. Scott Fitzgerald's novels and short stories reflected the carefree youth culture and post-World War ideals. Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda lived the life he wrote about in his books. They experienced the Roaring Twenties firsthand. Fitzgerald wasn't the only author people were reading in the Twenties. A group of writers who were discontented with life in post-war America fled to Europe. While living in Paris, writers like Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein wrote great novels that dealt with the themes of loss and discontent felt by many Americans after World War I. Stein dubbed this group the Lost Generation, and together they struggled to find meaning in what they saw as a senselessly changed world. While reading was still a favorite pastime of many Americans, movies were gaining in popularity. Audiences thrilled at the comedies of Charlie Chaplin, the sweeping romances of Rudolph Valentino, and the freewheeling flapper antics of Clara Bow. Movies were a reflection of society's attitudes, but more and more, styles and attitudes were being influenced by the cinema. In 1927, sound was introduced to the movies, and their popularity grew even further. The 1920s was also known as a golden age of sports. College football was at a peak in popularity, and professional football was rapidly catching on. Red Grange, a fullback from the University of Chicago, was called the Galloping Ghost for his speed and agility, running 3,637 yards between 1923 and 1925. His fans followed him closely when he joined the Chicago Bears in 1925, further increasing the popularity of professional football. The sporting event of the decade occurred in boxing, when undisputed heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey lost his title to Gene Tunney. Dempsey had held the championship for seven years prior to his defeat. Spectators who couldn't make the event, which took place in Philadelphia to commemorate the city's 150th anniversary, listened to it at home on their radio receivers. Women, too, participated in the golden age of sports. Gertrude Ederle became a national sensation when she swam the English Channel in the summer of 1926. She became the first woman to swim the channel, and she topped the record set by a male by two hours. But the greatest luminary of the golden age of sports emerged in baseball. George Herman Ruth, nicknamed Babe Ruth, began his career with the New York Yankees on January 3, 1920. During his first year, he hit 54 home runs. In 1923, Ruth had a 393 batting average, and was named MVP of the American League. That same year, Yankee Stadium was opened in the Bronx. It was referred to as the house that Ruth built. With the assistance of the Sultan of Swat, the Yankees won six pennants and three World Series during the 20s. Perhaps one of the largest contributions to society in the 20s came in the form of jazz music. 
African-American musicians developed jazz in New Orleans, but it soon became the staple of nightclubs and speakeasies from Chicago to New York. Talented musicians like cornet player and band leader Louis Armstrong, composer Duke Ellington, and blues singer Bessie Smith helped develop the sound, and white musicians like Benny Goodman helped popularize this new music with white audiences, who began flocking to hear jazz and dance the Charleston in nightclubs and speakeasies. Many of these clubs, like the Cotton Club in New York City's Harlem, only accepted white patrons. Despite the social inequalities, this uniquely African-American music flourished. On February 12, 1924, a white composer by the name of George Gershwin debuted his Rhapsody in Blue in a concert hall in New York City. The composition, which was heavily influenced by jazz, became a popular concert piece. From that point on, it was clear that the Roaring Twenties could just have easily been called the Jazz Age. Jazz was only one element of a great artistic movement happening in Harlem in the 1920s. The movement was called the Harlem Renaissance, and it encompassed not only music, but literature and politics as well. Jazz had become the most popular music of the time, but writers like Langston Hughes and Gene Toomer did much to introduce African-American culture and concerns to the world. Marcus Garvey became the most important political leader of the Harlem Renaissance with his Universal Negro Improvement Association. As the largest black organization in U.S. history, the UNIA stressed racial pride and self-rule. Marcus Garvey sought to create an independent black economy and planned to lead followers to the creation of the Empire of Africa, a new nation in Africa that would provide African Americans with the liberties they were denied in the United States. Despite the advancements made by African Americans in Harlem, minorities and recent immigrants were largely untouched by the prosperity of the decade. For African Americans in the South, the way of life had remained largely unchanged since the post-Civil War period. Many African Americans worked as sharecroppers, giving up most of their crops to white landlords in exchange for the right to work the land. Most recent immigrants worked for low wages in factories, Added to these hardships was the fact that the 1920s was a period of intense nativism. White Americans who believed they had the rights to the land were called nativists. Nativism was based largely on xenophobia, the fear of anything strange or foreign. One of the largest nativist groups in America was the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK was anti-black, anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic and anti-immigrant. They blamed American Catholics for placing allegiance to the Pope above that of the United States and believed Jews controlled movies and music, using them to promote sinful activities. The group spread outward into the Midwest, and by 1923 they controlled three state governments. By 1924, the Klan was at its peak in popularity, boasting more than four million members, including politicians and high-ranking members of law enforcement. Clan members used to go on nighttime sprees of violence where they would terrorize or lynch those they saw as enemies to their way of life. This is not to say that all those in power were corrupted by the politics of the Klan. In September 1923, the governor of Oklahoma placed the state under martial law in an attempt to reduce Klan violence. Police arrested over 4,000 Klansmen during the three weeks the martial law was in effect. Still, the KKK remained a force to be reckoned with. In 1925, 40,000 Klansmen marched down Pennsylvania Avenue as an exhibition of their political power. Nativist views weren't just restricted to fringe groups like the KKK. In 1921, 1924, and 1929, the U.S. government passed new restrictive immigration laws. These laws were designed to prevent potential troublemakers from entering America. But there was a racist element to the quota system which favored immigrants from Northern and Western Europe who were predominantly Anglo-Saxons. The quota system sharply limited the number of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, 
thereby limiting the entry of Jews and Italian Catholics into the country. Asian immigrants were completely banned. Part of the reason for this fear of foreigners was anxiety about the rising threat of communism throughout the world. The fear became known as the Great Red Scare. Americans were fearful that foreign radicals were planning on overthrowing the government and abolishing America's democratic way of life. In 1920, Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer rounded up more than 4,000 people, among them alleged communists, socialists, and anarchists. That same year, Sacco and Vanzetti, two Italian immigrants believed to be anarchists, were arrested for armed robbery and murder. In 1921, they were found guilty and both were sentenced to die in the electric chair. Many Americans were outraged by the verdict and protested on behalf of the accused, fearing they were condemned for their unpopular political beliefs. Despite the demonstrations, Sacco and Vanzetti were executed in 1927. In the wake of the rapidly changing nation, new ideas that challenged convention were met with skepticism and fear. On April 24, 1925, a high school teacher in Dayton, Tennessee named John T. Scopes gave his students a lecture on Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. He was subsequently arrested because the previous month Tennessee had passed a law forbidding the teaching of evolution in public schools. Fundamentalists found Darwin to be in opposition to the teachings of the Bible. The American Civil Liberties Union hired one of the most famous lawyers of the time, defense attorney Clarence Darrow, to defend Scopes. Tennessee state officials hired former presidential nominee and famed prosecutor William Jennings Bryan to argue on behalf of the fundamentalists. The two-week trial called the Monkey Trial in the press began on July 10, 1925. Darrow made it a point to poke holes in Brian's case, going so far as to call Brian to the stand to testify as a biblical expert. Darrow carefully crafted his questions in the hopes that Brian's answers would cause laughter throughout the courtroom and win support for the defense. But at the trial's end, the jury sided with the fundamentalists. Scopes was found guilty and was forced to pay a $100 fine. Darrow used the case as a platform to the media in order to arouse interest in Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's theories have subsequently become a standard part of many school science programs. Tragically, prosecutor William Jennings Bryan died of a heart attack just five days after the trial ended. In the 1920s, newspapers thrived on the sensational stories of the day. It was a period where heroes, gangsters, and scandals all vied for front-page headlines. Arguably, the most celebrated heroes of the day came from the world of aviation. After World War I, many former pilots performed death-defying stunts in order to earn a living, grabbing headlines and the imaginations of the nation. From these barnstormers emerged Charles Lindbergh, who went on to become one of the decade's most revered celebrities. On May 20th, 1927, Lindbergh became the first person to successfully fly a solo transatlantic flight. His plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, departed New York and touched down in Paris 33 hours and 29 minutes later. This 3,610 mile journey proved that aviation was a viable means of transportation. Just three months after Lucky Lindy's flight, eight separate airlines were offering flights between various American cities. A trip from New York to Boston took three hours by plane and proved considerably faster than the railroad. Before long, a female aviator was commanding the majority of newspaper headlines. 
In 1928, Amelia Earhart became the first woman to cross the Atlantic by plane as a passenger. Later that same year, she became the first person to fly round-trip solo across the U.S. Her trip took her from New York to Los Angeles and back to New York again. Notable villains got a fair share of publicity as well. Organized crime was on the rise in the 1920s as gangsters violated prohibition and created expansive empires by selling bootlegged alcohol. The most infamous of these gangland figures was Al Capone, known in the press as Scarface because of a four-inch scar on his left cheek. By 1926, Capone was leading a Chicago-based crime ring which included over 700 men, 10,000 speakeasies, and bootlegging operations that spanned from Florida to Illinois. Gangsters like Capone were often seen by the public as heroic for their defiance of authority. But in 1929, a ruthless execution-style killing in a garage on North Clark Street claimed the lives of seven men. This horrific event, called the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, turned the tide of public opinion against Al Capone. Even though it was common knowledge that Capone ordered the hit, no arrest was made. It would be two more years before Capone was sent to prison, and he was never charged with murder. Capone was convicted for income tax evasion in 1931. The year 1920, which saw Babe Ruth become one of the nation's greatest heroes, was also the year that baseball suffered one of its greatest scandals. On September 28th, eight members of the Chicago White Sox admitted to accepting $100,000 in bribes for throwing the first, second, and final games of the 1919 World Series to the Cincinnati Reds. All eight members of the team were suspended, and the team was referred to as the Black Sox in the press. Scandal rocked the Harlem Renaissance when, in 1923, Marcus Garvey was sent to prison. The head of the Universal Negro Improvement Association was convicted of mail fraud. President Coolidge pardoned Garvey two years later, but the scandal had hurt his organization beyond repair, ruining any chances Garvey had of establishing the Empire of Africa. Even politics saw a major scandal early in the decade. Albert Fall, the Secretary of the Interior during the Harding administration, secretly leased federally protected Navy oil reserves to Harry Sinclair of Mammoth Oil Company. This was just the beginning of what became known as the Teapot Dome Scandal, which got its name for the teapot-shaped rock located near the oil reserves. Fall continued taking bribes from oil companies totaling nearly $400,000 in exchange for allowing those companies to illegally exploit the government oil reserves. A Senate committee led by Senator Robert La Follette discovered the scheme and it sent shockwaves through the Harding and Coolidge administrations. Many cabinet members were forced to resign. Albert Fall was removed from office, tried and convicted of receiving bribes. He was fined $100,000 and forced to serve a year in prison. For many, the Teapot Dome scandal became a symbol for corruption in the government. The lack of any other major scandals during the presidency of Calvin Coolidge restored many Americans' faith in government in the years following the Teapot Dome scandal. Coolidge's faith in big business ushered in the long period of wealth and prosperity that rewarded many in middle and upper class society. This prosperity virtually guaranteed the election of fellow Republican Herbert Hoover as President of the United States in 1928. Hoover continued the laissez-faire hands-off policies of his predecessors, and the economic gains continued. The stock market continued a steady rise, and it seemed to have no end. In a speech, Hoover is quoted as saying, before long, poverty will be banished from this land. Unfortunately, the optimism shared by President Hoover and the American people was not entirely grounded in reality. In reality, the end was very near. By the final years of the 1920s, the concentration of American wealth was resting with an increasingly smaller percentage of the population. While employee wages had improved during the decade, it was the top businessmen who reaped most of the benefits of the exploding economy. 
This ever-widening gap between rich and poor was beginning to hamper the economic boom. That, coupled with decreasing industrial production and massive overspeculation in the stock market, set the stage for an economic crisis. On Thursday, October 24, 1929, the market dropped sharply and a massive sell-off began. Prices kept falling and investors were forced to sell their stocks at a loss. On a day that came to be known as Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929, the stock market crashed and countless investors lost all of their money. The crash brought the Roaring Twenties to a screeching halt and paved the way for the Great Depression that would last for the next decade. The 1920s was a unique time in the history of America. It was a time when the country, daunted by its new role as an international power, retreated from the world stage to work on the problems at home. The result was a period of social, political, and economic experimentation, whose successes and failures helped to shape the nation we live in today. The 20s was the beginning of the modern era. A fever pitch of prosperity, artistic achievement, and technological advancements. It was the combination of all these elements that made the 20s roar.